You may be seated. Lord Jesus, we're so glad that we're here today. We're talking about the journey with Jesus today, and we're going to talk a little bit about Father's Day, just to, to be reminded that this is a special day that we take time in the year to recognize our fathers. So I would like for all of our fathers to please stand. Fathers, brothers, let's just honor them today. As they are standing, let's just pray for our fathers and pray for our service. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the men in this congregation who have fathered children. And there are many here who not only have fathered children, but they are a father to children. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would bless these men of God. Thank you for them. We pray for your anointing to be upon their families that they would rise to be all, God, that you have designed them to be as they influence their families for the kingdom of God. So put your hand on them, and we thank you for them today. They are a blessing to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have uh, some scripture today, and you're going to say, wow, what in the world are you trying to share with us today? We've morning uh, before us in quite unique different ways and uh, I would like for us to look at Ephesians 5 23 and you say well, why are you bringing this up because you're going to be talking about husbands for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church he is the savior of his body the church as the church submits to Christ, so you wives must, should, submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. This is with verse 33. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. May God's blessing come upon the word of God today. You say, well, you're talking about husbands. You're not talking about fathers. But I'm here to tell you that there have been questions in my life all through ministry. I was even at the dentist office a couple months ago. And they said, uh, you're the pastor of the church? Well, how does that relate to your husband? And, you know, they have all these questions. And I said, oh, you don't understand. The head of our home is Rob. Rob is the head of our house. And God designed structure just as he does with the church. And I'll be sharing a little bit. Uh, about the updates at uh, General Assembly, but God has ways in which he structures places and things and organizations. And in the home, we understand that the man is the head of our home. What becomes very difficult about when God is the head of the church, sometimes we begin to say all kinds of excuses that God is the head of the church, and so we don't have to abide by any leadership. But God is in charge of the church. He says this is his bride, and we live up to submitting to Jesus even in the church. What becomes difficult for many husbands is when their wife will not respect them, or maybe they've not lived up to all the expectations. And so the wife begins to create conflict in the home because they want to have the final say. And we all know that in any group or organization, somebody has to have the final say. But women know how to control and want to manipulate 
and try to make sure that they are getting their way. Yeah, we sometimes should And we hold back our love and our affection. We begin to argue and, and fight and tension comes in the home when we have not learned how to respect and love our spouse and begin to pray for those areas. And men then want to please their husband. God gave this innate desire to want to love on their wife. They love them deeply. And then they're married to this person who is creating all this conflict for them. And they becomes difficult to love because they're like, I I'm in church. And why are you questioning? And why are you fighting? And why is all this going on? So the high call of God for the men in the church as well, that God calls men and women into leadership. But when God begins to move in that family and we understand who is in charge in the home, there's unity and there's a give and take and there's a working together and there's a synergy that begins to move forward in the life of that marriage. And I am so thankful for a husband who loves me and uh, I respect him and he wants the best for me. And sometimes it goes my way. This is what Rob says. Man may be the head of the house, but the woman is the neck and she controls it which way it goes. But we know that isn't true and that's not how it should be. It should not be a fight and a tension because our children are watching how we interrelate and how we communicate and, and how we love one another and want the best. And it's so hard when you want something so bad and there is conflict and you're disagreeing on it. But when the woman submits... It's beautiful. And that's why I'm able to do what I do today. Is because in my early years of marriage, I learned to submit to the one who is in charge of our home. And because of that, over time, it took time because I was a strong-willed individual and I remember going to counseling. Some of you might know uh, Reverend Scamelhorn, and he counseled us. And when he was done, Rob loves to be able to say this because he said, I don't know, you both are very strong-willed and determined in where you're going. I didn't think I was. I was an introvert. He was an introvert, but we were both. It doesn't mean that. And he says, so I, I'm not sure all these tests that we've taken in this marriage counseling situation. And the beautiful part is that we can say it'll be 42 years on Tuesday that God can do anything. But when we learn to submit with one another to one another, just as we submit to Christ in the church, there is a sense of, I can trust you. I can trust you. You're not against me. You're, you're with me. We're working together. And so when we journey with Christ on this Father's Day, I'm here to say thank you to the father that I had who passed away some 20 years ago, who influenced into my life. And we understand that when time comes, death will come to us all. I don't think every day about my father or communicate with him. But I am who I am today a great deal because of the dad that I had. For that wonderful man of God. And I am thanking you men as well who stand up for what is true and right in your family. And to be encouraged today that God is watching. He's strengthening. Let's just watch this. Thank our. It's Father's Day. A time to celebrate all the wonderful fathers out there. Not just for being shining examples of how great a dad can be. 
but also for being wonderful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important just knowing you're there when we need you. You've been patient with us, helping us to grow and learn from all the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today, we thank you, Dad, for all of this and so much more. Happy Father's Day. The thousands. I don't know how Jesus spoke to the thousands and they all heard him because he never had a microphone, right? I want to share with you, um, I know this makes it difficult for those who are watching online, but you tell me when I can go. I want to share with you a little bit about my journey in this last week of going to General Assembly. I am privileged, Rob and I both, to be a part of a church that supports us in doing that and as a board in making that decision to financially help us to do that. I am humbled by that and grateful and I want to take a few moments of this service to be able to share with you uh, what all took place. General Assembly had many worship services. We have um, a leadership in the Church of the Nazarene uh, that is run by six general superintendents. All of this is there to help hold us accountable. And a part of those few days that we were there, we had services sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the evening. And so we had, um, oh, hold on just a second. I've got to get this straight because my notes are in another one. We had um, each one of them sharing in one of the services or another. And um, one of them was talking about Go, and this is Dr. Dwart. He was one of our general superintendents, is one of ours, and his was all on Go. Another general superintendent is Carla Sunberg. Uh, she is the only female on the board. And the whole theme for the entire, all of the services and the time that we were there is to magnify the idea that Jesus is Lord. And it was a time of encouragement. Another one of our GSs is Dr. Crocker. And each time I would just say, God, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me through this man who emphasized that of following after him? The next one was, what is God desiring for me? He was our general, he is our general superintendent who retired this year. His name is Dr. Graves, and he talked on worship. And I really feel that in our walk with Jesus, it starts with a relationship with him. The next one is Dr. Busick. Oh, and you can get any of these messages online if you wanna hear them. And his was all on sharing, and he was so thankful that uh, some, individuals in the Oklahoma church 
went out and actually ministered to his dad and adopted him and said, we want to help you. He was 17 years old. And this 17-year-old was in multiple homes. I think it was like nine different homes. He was the biggest problem in the family. And Dr. Busick said that somebody went in there and took his grandpa and said, I'm going to have you come into our home and we're just going to love on you. And he gave his life to Jesus and he wanted to be a pastor. And his grandpa went to, was trying to go to school, but nobody would accept him. He had some limitations. And uh, so he just decided he was going to be a custodian there at the university at SNU. Uh, Southern Nazarene University and in doing so at his death of early death in his 50s he ended up I, I this was so impactful he ended up having a funeral and they said it packed out the sanctuary it packed out everything because everything his grandpa did was his father I'm sorry his father did was to just glorify Jesus and he wanted Jesus to be known to the people there Little did his father know, did, little did that family know that when they adopted this young boy, that his son would become a GS in the Church of the Nazarene. So he says, when you share with somebody, you don't know the impact that it'll have on the next generation. Praise the name of Jesus. Dr. Chombo was one, he talked on love. Carla gave the address, she never, quadrennial address, she never spoke uh, in a worship service necessarily, but she was giving us and letting us know uh, and to remind us that we are a church, a Christian church, a holiness church, a missional church. Uh, we are called to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. And presently we have 164 uh, uh, world areas that we minister to. I want to tell you that they started out the service, the very first service with, they do this all the time, and there's thousands of people in the auditorium at the convention center and they start with flags coming in and they name every one of those areas and it takes 13 minutes and it's moving and it's emotional because you realize the sacrifice that people made to be able to go to those world areas and share the good news of Jesus and sometimes it's just a few people. You can see when the worship services would come out, the crowds would come because it was over 10,000. Some have talked that um, they were planning on 20,000. Not all of them would end up in every service, but some coming and going um, throughout the time. Another piece of this, of General Assembly, was the fellowship of the church. There's a benefit of going to General Assembly because I get to see so many different individuals uh, who come and that I have served alongside of. And so I have this verse for you, Galatians 6, 9, so let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And many of the GSs were trying to say, we don't have a harvest problem, we have a worker problem. And he, they used the analogy of going into a restaurant and we experienced that while we were there empty booths all around but yet people waiting outside to come in because they didn't have enough workers in that restaurant and that's kind of across the nation and around the world uh, because people are not coming back to work like they used to we don't have a harvest problem the people are waiting to hear about jesus we have a worker problem and so we don't want to get tired doing what god has called us to do this next picture is a gal who saw me across the way and she said, Pastor Becky, she worked in my children's department in Colorado Springs and she was very missional and we would have these big to-dos for missions in Colorado Springs for children and she was a part of that leadership that was there. This next picture you're going to notice, Julie McKethan, she was also a part of Colorado Springs, she was in my children's department, who reaped the benefits of Esther in the previous picture. Also, Julie McKethan, we call her our Lynx missionary, and we're going to have Faith Promise next week, so we don't want you to miss that 10 o'clock service combined. Lynx means we are connecting with different individuals, a missionary across the way, and Julie happens to be it. When I heard, Julie, you know... <laughs> She comes across the crowds and you wonder how, with all those people, how can they see you? But you know, 
Only God could orchestrate that. It was a beautiful uh, experience there, and now she is a missionary, and so we reap the benefits of serving our children and emphasizing missions. And the next one is pictures there of people, one gal over there, she oversaw caravans and she worked tirelessly hours and we would run a hundred and some children. We have some that were there from Virginia and you think, oh, well maybe you just um, uh, gave out to all these people. I'm here to tell you that everyone I served alongside of, I received something. And this next picture shows you those individuals who were on staff, some who volunteered in the upper right uh, left-hand corner, your left-hand corner, um, this gentleman was a pastor uh, at heart. He was a dentist, but he worked full-time as a dentist, and he was a preacher in the Church of uh, Virginia, and he volunteered that, and he was on staff, so to speak, without pay, and he basically would support the pe senior pastor that was there, and he would preach. I learned, worked alongside of him, learned a lot about adult ministries before I came here. An associate over there from Porterville, I learned from, praise God. This next couple here that I'm showing you are said, oh, you're still in Colorado Springs. Now, different churches go through waves of hardship and good times. And I said, and you're still there? Yes, she said, and you know what? God calls some people to stay at a church through the thick and the thin, through the good and the bad. And she said, and that's where we are. God has called us here and held us steady. And that's what I see in many of you. You are there through the trying times. And that is Becky and Dan Voss. And I praise God for them uh, that they are there. This uh, next picture is a girl named Barbie Corder, I want you to be encouraged by this young lady. Not so young anymore as she used to be, but she was at the Porterville Church where I got called into ministry. And I share this as a testimony to you that God is working, God is moving around the world, and he has moved in my own personal life. She was a volunteer who came in. And, she, and I saw the call of God on her life to be in ministry as a pastor, but she was fighting it, so to speak. She was burned out from a previous church she was at, and she said, oh no, I, I couldn't do that. She had a heart for children. She had a special emphasis in preschool, early childhood education. And so in our time that was there, she and I began to say, I think we can do a preschool here at this church in Porterville. And so we went down to the Cerritos Church of the Nazarene and we got information that was there. She had a group of little tiny children in her home, but she said, I think I can move them over to the church and we can have a little base of what we can do there. Over time, miracles began to happen, but it wasn't without trial. It wasn't without pushing. It wasn't without conflict because I can remember going to the board and saying it and there was this opposition that said, no, and so then I'd come back and I'd bring it to the board and I would say, I think this is a good idea. We can minister to these children. No. And John Denny was the pastor at the time and he made a comment and she shared with me. You can see this picture is us in the airport. She wasn't flying out till eight in the evening and it was two in the afternoon. And she said, we just came early. It wasn't happenstance that I got to see her. She's walking along because she got her little drink to, uh, from Starbucks and she's coming along and then she began to share. It was in that time that things were presented to the board. We started that little preschool inside and trying to work out how we're going to have bathrooms, how we're going to have this, and we began to work on it. But God called me then to Colorado and the end of the story had not become realized because that little preschool soon grew into 97 children today, amen? 97 children, she thought. Now that's individuals, they might come for an afternoon session or a morning session. But in that journey, I realized vision to reality happens when the pastor is able to see what needs to happen. Well, the pastor did. 
The board needs to see it. There was a little bit of conflict for a little while. And then the people need to see it. And it needs to always be bathed in prayer. Sometimes a pastor can come with a vision of what they see, but then what happens? The board doesn't see it yet. And they wait and they pray. And sometimes the board sees it, but then the people don't see it. Because, see, we're a church and we work together. And it takes time and prayer, as you can see in that next slide. We want to see God's vision become a reality so that all people are a part of what God is doing. And the timing was perfect. And God has blessed that little preschool. Here are some pictures of it that meant that there were fences that had to go up and playground areas that had to be there. And God moved in that situation. God provided, she said, you cannot believe the different finances that came in because people then caught the vision of what was before them. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. If we make our decisions and move forward only on what we see, we will miss out on the faith opportunity that God affords to us as a church. Praise God. General Assembly was also a time of voting on delegates, these two delegates. There's also manual issues and beliefs. The manual is all the beliefs and everything and all the guidelines of the church. And so it holds us accountable. And sometimes we have to get the wording to be more up to date and make sense to this next generation. So every four years, they address different things. Now, here's a picture of my granddaughter. She and my daughter were there. These are the six GSs, and as you can see, my son took a picture of her. And you're going to say, wow, she got up close to those GSs. Well, I'm here to tell you, they were cardboard. They look pretty real, don't they? And so she just had fun just going over there and standing by them so that you could kind of see a picture. And when I see this stand-up picture, and they all were in a location over there, um, she was there and said, hey, Look at me. The next picture is the two general superintendents that were voted in, Dr. Uh, Scott Daniels and Dr. Christian Sarmiento. Praise the name of Jesus. And when I say that, there were a thousand delegates at this general assembly. That means a thousand people voting. And um, they had to have a two-thirds vote in. Everything is done carefully and organized, and the people have a say. And the GSs have a say, and committees have met prior to General Assembly to hash out some of these uh, issues and some of these things. And I'm very proud of the Church of the Nazarene on how they unify everybody and include everybody in that. Another part is the breakout sessions. There's discipleship, missions groups, youth groups, and all. I want to show you this next picture because this is Reverend Courtney Turner. Now, I know you can't really see a close-up picture, but Reverend Courtney Ten Turner was in my children's ministries in Porterville. And now she's working on her doctorate, and she's going to be a professor at Southern Nazarene University. Wow. I got to see her because this was a woman's breakout session, and she was the emceer of that session. I thank you, Jesus. Matthew 9, 38 says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. And that's what I feel like I do at every location that I'm at, is to pray that Jesus will raise up people who will be called, anointed by God, to serve in the church. The next picture, it was encouraging to hear some women speakers. I know that's not great pictures with my camera there, my little phone. But we had three district superintendents who, were, who are women around the world and one pastor. God uses men and he uses women to be called by God 
to do what he has called and equipped them to do. So we returned to Arizona, and while I was on this flight, there was this gal that I got to know on this flight. And you say, I, I mean, it's as a three-hour flight from Minneapolis to Phoenix. And she began to just touch me and touch me, and I'm thinking, I just want to relax, and I want to sleep, or whatever I want to do. She touches me again. It's hard to understand, so I took a piece of paper that was in the front. It was really a bag in case she got sick on the flight. I didn't know what else to do. So I said name, and she wrote out her name. Her name is Amu. She told me she was from Erodi. I said, I don't know where that is. And let me just tell you, you ask Rob. He says, I don't know how in the world you were able to understand anything that she said. I said, I didn't. I got one word here and there. But this I do know, her husband had died in the last year. And she would begin to cry. She would begin to cry. And I said, God's peace be on you. She didn't know what peace is. She asked me what my job is. I said, Pastor, she didn't understand me. I said, Lord, how am I ever going to witness to this lady? She needs Jesus. Because if you know India, they believe that everything is a God. He says, God loves you. The God who created you loves you. We exchanged information. I have some stuff here that you wouldn't believe. She's 78 years old. She's a teacher. And, I said, and then I would sit back just a second. And I pray and say, Jesus, how do I communicate with her? And he says, you're doing more than you will ever know. I trust my God in saying that. Because who knows? She's heading to Phoenix to live with her son and their family. And she had just taken a two-day trip of flying all the way from India to different places. And she sat by me and said, God loves you. Do you know God? And then I think later, oh my goodness, everything is a God to her. God made you. God loves you. Do I know if she understood? I don't know. Pray for Amu. We had time with our family for a day, and I want to remind you that I was able to be with my one daughter, who is a pastor up in Washington, and got to be with them in the services and my grandkids. But I also got to go to Arizona. We, we flew into Arizona. It was a lot cheaper. And so, of course, we got to be with our new grandbabies. So we got to be with all six grandchildren, all three children in their families throughout that week. Galatians 6, 9, so let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I can say that to you because I've been in ministry for 30 years. And sometimes we don't see or we think it just takes forever. And God is saying, you just give it to me and you watch and you keep praying and you're going to be able to see. And it may not happen in your lifetime. It may not happen while you're in ministry over there. But I have watched over it and heard story after story after story. And I just said, God be the glory. I can't tell you how many times I cried sitting at home thanking God for what he has done. And so all the while, just like I would say in every service, what is God saying to you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And we thank you for working in our lives. We give this as a testimony, a testimony to you, Jesus, that you are the great I am. You are Lord and you are Savior. And I thank you, God, for working beyond what we could ever imagine, taking care of things that even as this lady sitting in the next seat next to me, and I'm just saying, God, save this woman for the name of Jesus Christ through your sake, Lord. And do something that I cannot do. I have been in so many situations that I could not do it. But you came in and you said, I'm working. I'm doing. Trust me. And so, Jesus, every person, every volunteer who is here, we thank you for them. And we pray that you would strengthen them. That you would encourage them. That you would give them a vision for their area. And that, Jesus, they will not grow weary in doing good. But when they reap a harvest, it will be to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
want to talk to you a little bit about baptism because we are going to do a baptism today. Acts 2, 37 to 40, told you it was going to be different. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, uh, what, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. And then you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, to those who are far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. God saves children and youth and adults. Praise the name of Jesus. And Peter continued preaching for a long time. I had to underline that. <laughs> when I first started, I was like, I don't know if I have enough to say. It's 15 minutes and that's all I have to say. Bye. <laughs> Peter had a long sermon because he had a lot to say, and sometimes it takes a while to get it all out. Strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. As Rob comes up, I'm going to have him give a testimony. And in this time of baptism, he was telling me that 19 times baptism is brought up in the New Testament. As he comes up, I'm going to read Mark 16, 15 to 16. And he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Christ showed by an example that he was baptized. Is it because he sinned? No, he did not sin. He showed an example to us that we should be baptized. Many excuses today of not getting baptized, it says it's not of works. You don't do it because, you know, it, it's, a, it's not a have to. I would have to say to you that if it's not by works, all through scripture talks about faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Does baptism save you? No. But radical obedience is what Christ asks of us. So all through scripture, here's another one. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age spoken by jesus himself isn't that beautiful to see all these children in here today to watch this baptism praise you jesus i would never want to tell a child that they can live however they want to and that they just ask jesus to forgive them of their sins we know that that kind of thinking is wrong no it's a high call to surrender and to obey everything that god lays upon our heart and baptism is a humble heart to live out the call of God. It's the beginning of something beautiful. We don't have time. If, if you want to know more about baptism, put on your communication card. Want more information, we'll have a class for you. You want to know how you can become a member of the church? Some of you are wanting to know. You put it on your communication card. We'll talk to you about what the Church of the Nazarene and what we believe in some of those things. So you can put it out in the card back there. And now I have a wonderful man of God that I highly respect who is going to share his testimony. And when we're done, we're going to go to the back.